This is a reading of Nicomachean Ethics by the great Greek philosopher Aristotle, read by Momus Najmi. Nicomachean Ethics, Book 2, Chapter 1 Now since virtue is of two sorts, one pertaining to thinking and the other to character, Excellence of thinking is for the most part both in its coming to be and in its growth, a result of teaching, for which reason it has need of experience and time, while excellence of character comes into being as a consequence of habit, on account of which it even gets its name by a small inflection from habit. It is also clear from this that none of the virtues of character comes to be present in us by nature, since none of the things that are by nature can be habituated to be otherwise. For example, a stone, which by nature falls downward, could not be habituated to fall upward, not even if one were to train it by throwing it upward ten thousand times nor could fire be habituated to move downward, nor could any of the things that happen by nature in one way be habituated to happen in another way. Therefore the virtues come to be present, neither by nature nor contrary to nature, but in us who are of such a nature as to take them on and to be brought to completion in them by means of habit. Also with those things that come to belong to us by nature, we are provided with the potencies for these beforehand, and we produce the being at work of them in return. This very thing is obvious in the case of the senses, for it was not from repeatedly seeing or repeatedly hearing that we took on the senses, but on the contrary, having them, we used them. We did not get them, by using them. But we do take on the virtues by first being at work in them, just as also in other things, namely the arts, the things that one who has learned them needs to do, we learn by doing, and people become, say, house builders by building houses, or harpists by playing the harp. So too we become just by doing things that are just temperate by doing things that are temperate, and courageous by doing things that are courageous. What happens in cities gives evidence of this, for lawmakers make the citizens good by habituating them, and since this is the intention of every lawmaker, those that do not do it well are failures, and one regime differs from another, in this respect as a good one from a worthless one. Also it is from and by means of the same things that every virtue both comes into being and is destroyed, and similarly every art, for people become both good harpist and bad harpist from harp playing. And it is analogous with house builders that all the rest, from building houses well, people will be good house builders, and from building them badly, they will be bad ones. If it were not that way, there would have been no need of a teacher, but everyone would have been born good or bad at the arts. And it is the same way in the case of the virtues, for by acting in our dealings with people some of us become just, others unjust, and by acting in frightening situations and getting habituated to be afraid or to be confident, some of us become courageous and others become cowards. And it is similar with the things that are involved with desires and with angry impulses. For some people become temperate and gentle, while others become spoiled and irritable. The ones from turning themselves this way in these situations, the others from turning themselves that way. In a word, active states come into being from being at work in similar ways. Hence, it is necessary to make our ways of being at work be of certain sorts. For our active states 
follow in accordance with the distinctions among these. It makes no difference, then, to be habituated in this way or in that strait from childhood, but an enormous difference, or rather all the difference. Chapter 2 Now since our present occupation is not for the sake of contemplation, as the other kinds of study are, for we are investigating not in order that we might know what virtue is, but in order that we might become good, since otherwise there would be no benefit from it. It is necessary to investigate with respect to things involved in actions, how one ought to perform them, since these actions also determine the sorts of active states that come into being, as we have said. Now the phrase, acting in accordance with right reason, is commonly accepted and let it be set down. There will be a discussion of it later, both what right reason is and how it is related to the other virtues. But let this be acknowledged in advance, that every discourse that concerns actions is obliged to speak in outline and not precisely. Just as we said also at the beginning, then one ought to demand that discourses be in accord with their material, while matters that are involved in actions and are advantageous have nothing rigidly fixed about them, any more than do matters of health. And since the general discourse is of this sort, still more does the discourse that concerns particulars lack precision. For it falls under no art nor under any skill that has been handed down, but it is always necessary for those who are acting to look at the circumstances surrounding the occasion themselves, just as is the case also with the medical art or the art of steering a ship. But even though the present discourse is of this sort, one ought to try to help it along. First then, one must recognize this that things such as virtues are of such a nature as to be destroyed by deficiency and by excess. As we see, since one must see visible examples as evidence for visible things, in the case of strength and health for excessive gymnastic exercises, as well as deficient ones, destroys one's strength. And similarly, drink and food, when they come to be too much or too little, destroys one's health while proportionate amounts produce, increase and preserve these. And it is the same way also with temperance and courage and the other virtues. Someone who runs away from and fears everything and endures nothing becomes a coward, while someone who fears nothing at all but goes out to confront everything becomes rash. Similarly, someone who indulges in every pleasure and refrains from none becomes spoiled, while someone who shuns them all like a boorish bumpkin, becomes in a certain way insensible. So temperance and courage are destroyed by excess and deficiency, but are preserved by an intermediate condition. But it is not only the case that the same things from which and by the action of which they coming into being and increase comes about, produce their destruction as well but it is also in these same things that the being at work of the virtues will consist. For it is that way also in the more visible cases, such as that of strength, since strength comes from taking in a lot of food and enduring a lot of labor. While it is especially the strong person who would be capable of doing these very things. And so it is in the case of the virtues as well. For by refraining from pleasures, we become temperate. And once having some temperate, we are most capable of refraining from them. And it is similar in the case of courage. For by habituating ourselves to disdain frightening things and by enduring them, we become courageous. And having become courageous, we shall be most capable of enduring frightening things. Chapter 3 as a sign of the active states of one's soul, one must consider the pleasure or pain that accompanies one's deeds. For someone who refrains from bodily pleasures and delights in this very thing is temperate, 
but someone who does so while feeling burdened by it is spoiled and someone who endures terrifying things and delights in them or is at any rate not pained by them is courageous but someone who does so while being pained is a coward for the sort of virtue that belongs to character is concerned with pleasures and pains since it is on account of pleasure that we perform base actions and on account of pain that we refrain from beautiful actions hence it is necessary to be brought up in some way straight from childhood as plato says so as to take delight and feel pain in those things in which one ought for this is the right education also if the virtues are concerned with actions and feelings while pleasure or pain follows upon every feeling and every action for this reason do virtue would be concerned with pleasure and pains punishments indicate this too since they come about by means of these for they are a certain kind of medicines and medicines by their nature work through opposites also as we said just now every active condition of the soul is in its nature related to and concerned with the sorts of things by the action of which it naturally becomes worse or better and it is by means of pleasures and pains that people become base through pursuing and avoiding them either the ones one ought not or when one ought not or in a way one ought not or in as many other ways as such distinctions are articulated this is also why people define the virtues as certain states of freedom from passion and of calmness but they do not define them well because they say this simply but do not add as one ought and as one ought not and when and the rest therefore it is established that virtue of this sort is an aptitude productive of the best actions that concern pleasures and pains and that vice is the opposite and this might become evident to us from the following considerations that concern the same things for since there are three things that lead to choices and three that lead to avoidance the former being what is beautiful what is advantageous and what is pleasant and the contrary is being what is ugly what is harmful and what is painful the good person is apt to go right and the bad person is apt to go astray concerning all of these but especially concerning pleasure for this is shared with the animals and follows along with everything that comes by choice since even the beautiful and the advantageous seem pleasant also this has grown up with us all from infancy and for this reason it is difficult to scrub away this feeling since it is ingrained in our life and we measure our actions some of us more others less against a yardstick of pleasure and pain on account of this then it is necessary that our whole concern be about these things for to be delighted or pained well or badly plays no small role in our actions and it is even harder to fight against pleasure than heraclitus says it is to fight against anger but artfulness and virtue always come to the concerned with what is more difficult for it is better to do well at this and so for this reason the whole concern both of virtue and of politics is about pleasures and pains since one who deals with these well will be a good person and one who deals with them badly will be bad let it stand as stated then that virtue is concerned with pleasures and pains that it grows by the action of those things out of which it comes into being or is destroyed by them when they do not happen in the same way and that it is at work in connection with those things out of which it has come into being chapter 4 one might raise as an impasse though how we mean that it is necessary to become just by performing just actions and temperate by performing temperate actions 
For if people do things that are just or temperate, they already are just or temperate people. Just as if they do the things that have to do with writing or with music, they are literate or musical people. Or is it not even this way in the case of the arts? For it is possible to produce something literate by chance or by being advised by someone else. One will be literate then, only when one produces something literate and does so in a literate way, that is, in accordance with the art of writing within oneself. Anyway, it is not the same in the case of the arts as with the virtues. For the things that come into being by means of the arts have their being well made in themselves. It is sufficient for these to come into being in a certain condition. But with the things that come about as a result of the virtues, just because they themselves are a certain way, it is not the case that one does them justly or temperately, but only if the one doing them also does them being a certain way. If one does them first of all knowingly and next having chosen them and chosen them for their own sake and third being in a stable condition and not able to be moved all the way out of it. For having the other kinds of artfulness, these things do not count, except the mere knowing. But for having the virtues, the knowing is of little or no strength while the other conditions have not a little, but all the power. And they are the very ones which arise from repeatedly performing just or temperate actions. Thus, while the actions are called just or temperate, whenever they are the sorts of things that a just or temperate person would do, the one who does them is not just or temperate unless he also does them in the way that just and temperate people do them. It is well said then, that by performing just actions, one becomes a just person, and by performing temperate actions, one become a temperate person. And no one is going to become good by not performing these actions. But most people do not perform them, but believe that by taking refuge in talk, they are philosophizing, and in that way will be people of serious stature. Doing something similar to those sick people who listen to the doctors carefully but do none of the things they order. So just as they will be in a good condition in body if they treat themselves in this way, neither will those who philosophize in this way be in any good condition in soul. Chapter 5 After these things, one must examine what virtue is. Now since there are three kinds of things that come to be present in the soul, feelings, predispositions, and active conditions, virtue would be one of these. And by feelings I mean desire, anger, fear, confidence, envy, joy, affection, hatred, yearning, jealousy, pity, and generally those things which are accompanied by pleasure or pain. It is the predispositions in accordance with which we are said to be apt to feel these, such as those by which we are predisposed to be angry, or to be annoyed or to feel pity. And it is the active conditions in accordance with which we bear ourselves well or badly towards the feelings, for example, in relation to being angry. If we are that way violently or slackly, we bear ourselves badly. But if in a measured way, we bear ourselves well, and similarly in relations to other feelings. Now neither virtues nor vices are feelings, because we are not said to be of serious or trifling moral stature as a result of our feelings. But we are said to be so as a result of our virtues and vices, and because we are neither praised nor blamed as a result of our feelings, for one is not praised for being afraid or, or for being angry, nor is one blamed simply for being angry, but for being so in a certain way. 
but we are praised or blamed as a result of our virtues and vices. Also, we are angry and frightened without choice. But the virtues are certain kind of choices, or not present without choice. And on top of these things, as a result of the feelings, we are said to be moved, but as a result of the virtues and vices, we are said not to be moved, but to be disposed in a certain way. And for these reasons, the virtues and vices are not predispositions either, since we are not called good or bad, nor are we praised or blamed simply for being predisposed to feel something. Also, we are predisposed by nature, but we do not become good or bad by nature. But we spoke about this before. So if the virtues are neither feelings nor predispositions, what remains is that they are active conditions. Therefore, what virtue is, in the sense of the general class, to which it belongs, has been said. Chapter 6 But it is necessary to say not only this, that it is an active condition, but also what sort of active condition it is. And something one ought to state is that every virtue, as well as bringing that of which it is the virtue to completion in a good condition, also makes it yield work of a good kind, as the excellence of the eye makes both the eye and its work first rate since by means of the excellence of the eye we see well. Similarly, the excellence of a horse both makes it a first-rate horse and makes it good at running, at carrying its rider and at holding still in the face of enemies. So if this is the way things are in all cases, then also the virtue of a human being would be the active condition from which one becomes a good human being and from which one will yield up one's own work well. How this will be, we have already spoken of. But it will be clear in the following manner as well, if we examine what sort of nature virtue has. Now in everything continuous and divisible, it is possible to take a greater amount, a lesser amount, or an equal measure, but these either on account of the thing itself or in relation to us. And the equal measure is a certain kind of mean between excess and deficiency. By a mean that belongs to the thing, I am speaking of what holds a position equally apart from either of the extremes, which is one and the same thing for everyone. But the mean in relation to us is what neither goes too far nor falls short. And this is not one thing nor the same thing for everyone. For example, if ten are a lot and two are few, then six are a mean amount for those who take it according to the thing, since it both exceeds and is exceeded by an equal amount. And this is a mean according to the arithmetic proportion. But the mean in relation to us is not something one needs to take in this way. For it is not the case if ten pounds is a lot for someone to eat and two pounds a little, that the gymnastic trainer will prescribe six pounds, for perhaps even this is a lot for the one who is going to take it or a little. For it is a little to Milo, but to someone beginning gymnastic training it is a lot and it is similar with running and wrestling. Milo of Crouton was the Olympic champion wrestler six times. Reports credited him with being able both to carry and to eat a whole ox. Now in this way, everyone who has knowledge avoids excess and deficiency, but seeks the mean and chooses this, but not the mean that belongs to the thing, but the mean in relation to us. So if every kind of knowledge accomplishes its work well in this way, by looking to the mean and guiding its work towards this, which is why people are accustomed to remark about works that are in good condition, that it is not possible either to take anything away from or to add anything to them, on the grounds that excess and deficiency destroy what is well made. But the mean condition preserves it, 
and good craftsmen, as we are saying, do their work looking towards this. While virtue is something more precise and better than any art, just as nature is, then virtue would be something apt to hit the mean. I am speaking of virtue of character, for this is concerned with feelings and actions, and among these there is access and deficiency, and the mean. For instance, it is possible to be afraid or be confident, or to desire or be angry or feel pity, or in general to feel pleasure or feel pain both more and less, and on both sides not in the right way, but to feel them when one ought, and in the cases in which, and towards the people whom, and for the reasons for the sake of which, and the manner one ought is both a mean and the best thing which is what belongs to virtue. And similarly concerning actions also there is access and deficiency and the mean. And virtue is concerned with feelings and actions, in which access and deficiency go astray, while the mean is praised and gets them right, and both of these belong to virtue. Therefore virtue is a certain kind of mean condition, since it is, at any rate, something that makes one apt to hit the mean. Also, it is possible to go wrong in many ways, for what is bad belongs to what is unlimited, as the Pythagoreans conjectured, and what is good belongs among what is limited. But there is only one way to get something right, which is why the one is easy and the other is difficult, it being easy to miss the target and difficult to hit it. So for these reasons, access and deficiency belongs to vice, and the mean condition belongs to virtue. For the good are good simply, but the bad are bad in every sort of way. Therefore, virtue is an active condition that makes one apt at choosing, consisting in a mean condition in relation to us, which is determined by a proportion and by the means by which a person with practical judgment would determine it. And it is a mean condition between two vices, one resulting from excess and the other from deficiency, and is also a mean in the senses that the vices of the one sort fall short and those of the other sort go beyond what is appropriate both in feelings and in actions while virtue both discovers and chooses the mean. Hence in terms of its thinghood and the articulation that spells out what it is for it to be, virtue is a mean condition. But in terms of what is best and what is done well, it is an extreme. But not every action admits of a mean condition, nor does every feeling for some of them, as soon as they are named, are understood as having baseness involved with them, such as joy at others' misfortunes, shamelessness, and envy, and in the case of actions, adultery, stealing, and murder. For with all these things and things like them, what is meant is that the things themselves are base, and not the excesses or deficiencies of them. There is then never any possibility of getting anything right about them. But one always goes astray. Nor is there any doing well or not well about such things by committing adultery with the right woman and when and in the way one ought. But simply doing any of these things is to go wrong. It would be like believing that there was also a mean condition and an access and deficiency concerned with being unjust or coward or dissipated. For at that rate there would be a mean condition in access and in deficiency and an access in access and a deficiency in deficiency. But just as there is no access or deficiency of temperance or courage, because the mean is in a certain way an extreme, so there is no mean condition or access and deficiency of those other things. But however, one does them, one is in the wrong. In general, there is no mean in access and in deficiency, nor any access or deficiency of the mean condition. Chapter 7 
but it is necessary not just to speak of this universally, but also to apply it to the particulars. For in discourse about action, those that are universal are common to more instances, but those that are about parts of the topics are more truthful, since actions are concerned with particulars and discourse needs to harmonize with them. So one should take these from the list. There is a list of 14 virtues of character alongside their corresponding vices of access and deficiencies. See Udemian Ethics for this list. Now concerning fear and confidence, the main condition is courage of people who go to access. The one who exceeds in fearlessness is without a name and many of these things are nameless. The one who exceeds in confidence is rash and the one who exceeds in fearing but falls short is being confident is a coward. Concerning pleasures and pains, though not all of them and less so concerning pains, the mean condition is temperance and the access is dissipation. Those who fall short concerning pleasure don't turn up very often, for which reason they and their sort have not happened on a name, but let them be termed insensible. Concerning giving and taking money, the mean condition is generosity, the access and deficiency being wasteful and stinginess. In the latter, people exceed and fall short in contrary ways, for the wasteful person exceeds in letting go of things but falls short in getting them, while the stingy person exceeds in getting and falls short in letting go. Though we are speaking now in outline and under headings, content with just this. More precise distinctions will be made later about these topics. There are also other dispositions concerned with money. The mean condition being magnificence. For a magnificent person is different from a generous one, since the former is concerned with great things and the latter with small ones. The access being gaudiness or vulgarity and the deficiency being chintziness, and these differ from those that concern generosity, but in what way they differ will be said later. And concerning honor and dishonor, the mean condition is greatness of soul. The access is spoken of as a certain sort of vanity, and the deficiency is smallness of soul. And as we were saying, generosity was related to magnificence, differing by being concerned with small things, so too related in that way to greatness of soul, which is concerned with great honor. There is a certain disposition which is concerned with small honor, for it is possible to have an appetite for honor in the way one ought and also more or less than one ought. The person who exceeds in such appetites is called passionate for honor. The one who falls short is said to be lacking the passion for honor, and the person at the mean is without a name. The disposition too are without names, except that of the person passionate for honor, which is called the passion for honor, which shows that people at the extremes claim the right to the mean territory. And we do the same. There are times when we call the person at the mean passionate for honor and times when we speak of such a person as lacking the passion for honor. And times when we praise a person who is passionate for honor. But times when we praise a person who lacks a passion for honor. The reason why we do this will be stated in what follows. But for now, let us mention the rest of the virtues in the way that we have been led along. Concerning anger, there are also access, deficiency and a mean condition. And while they are pretty much without names, since we speak of the person at the mean as gentle, let us call the mean condition gentleness of the extremes. Let the person who exceeds be irritable and the wise irritability and let the one who falls short be slow to anger and the deficiency slowness to anger. And there are three other mean conditions that have some likeness to each other but differ from one another. For while they are all concerned with communal life in words and actions, they differ because one is concerned with what is true in them and the others with what is pleasant. Of the latter, 
one sort occurs in playfulness and the other in all things in the course of life. So one ought to speak about these also, in order that we might see more clearly that the mean condition is praised in everything. While the extremes are neither praised nor are they right, but they are blamed. Now most of these are also without names. But we ought to try, as in the other cases, to make up names ourselves for the sake of clarity and to make it easy to follow. Concerning truth, then, one who is at the mean is a truthful person, and let the mean condition be called truthfulness. Pretense in the direction of exaggeration is bragging, and the one who has it is a braggart. While pretense in the direction of understatement is irony, and the one who has it is ironic. Concerning what is pleasant in playfulness, the person at the mean is charming and the disposition is charm. The access is buffoonery, and one who has it is a buffoon, and the one who falls short is a certain sort of bore, and the active condition is boorishness. Concerning the remaining sort of pleasantness in life, the one who is pleasant in the way one ought to be is friendly, and the mean condition is friendliness. The one who goes to access, if it is for no purpose, is obsequious. But if it is for his own advantage, he is a flatterer. And the one who falls short and is unpleasant in everything is a certain sort of contrary person and hard to get along with. And there are also mean conditions among and involving the feelings. For while a sense of shame is not a virtue, the person with a sense of shame is also praised, since even in these matters one sort of person is spoken of as a mean, and another sort as going to access. As the shy person is ashamed about everything, the one who falls short or is ashamed about nothing at all is shameless, while the one at the mean is a person with a sense of shame. Righteous indignation is a mean condition between joy at the misfortunes of others and envy, which are concerned with pain and pleasure at what occurs among those who happen to be one's neighbor. For the person inclined towards righteous indignation is pain at those who fare well without deserving it, while the envious person exceeding that is pain at all those who fare well. And the one who takes joy in others' misfortune falls so short of being pained as to be delighted. But there will be a fitting occasion concerning these things in another place, and concerning justice, since it is not meant in a single sense. After distinguishing these, we will speak about the way in which both its kinds are mean conditions. Chapter 8 Since there are three dispositions, two of them vices, one resulting from access and the other from deficiency, and one of them a virtue, the mean condition, they are all in some way opposite to all, for the extremes are opposite both to the mean and to one another, while the mean is opposite to the extremes. Just as the equal amount is greater in relation to the lesser and less in relation to the greater, so too the mean active conditions exceed in relation to the deficiencies and fall short in relation to the excesses in both feelings and actions. For the courageous person appears rash in relation to the coward and cowardly in relation to the rash person, and similarly the temperate person appears dissipated in relation to the insensible person and insensible in relation to the dissolute person, and the generous person appears wasteful in relation to the stingy person, and stingy in relation to the wasteful person. Hence the people at each of the extremes push the person at the mean away towards the other extreme, and the coward calls the courageous person rash, while the rash person calls him a coward, and analogously in the other cases. But while they are opposed to one another in this way, 
The greatest contrariety belongs to the extremes in relation to one another, rather than to the mean. For these stand farther apart from one another than from the mean. Just as the great is farther from the small and the small from the great, then two of them are from the equal. Also, a great likeness to the mean shows up in some of the extremes, as in rashness is relation to courage or in wastefulness in relation to generosity. While in the extremes in relation to one another, there is the greatest unlikeness. But things standing at the greatest remove from one another are defined as contraries, so that the things standing at the greater remove would be the more contrary. In comparison with the mean, it is in some cases the deficiency that is more opposite, but in other cases the access, for example in relation to courage, it is not rashness, which is the access that is more opposite, but cowardice which is the deficiency, but in other cases the access, for example in relation to courage, it is not rashness, which is the access that is more opposite but cowardice, which is deficiency. But in relation to temperance, it is not insensibility, which is a lack, that is more opposite, but dissipation, which is the excess. This turns out to be the case for two reasons, one of which comes from the thing itself. For on account of one extremes being nearer to and more like the mean, we do not place this, but its contrary as more opposite to the mean. For example, since rashness seems to be more like courage and nearer to it, while cowardice seems more unlike it, we set the latter down as more opposite. Since the thing that stand at a greater remove from the mean seem to be more contrary to it. This then is one reason coming from the thing itself, but the other reason comes from us ourselves. For those things toward which we ourselves tend more by nature in any way appear more contrary to the mean. For example, we ourselves tend more by nature towards pleasure, on account of which we are more easily carried away toward dissipation than towards orderliness. For we more so call those things contrary, toward which the extra tendency occurs more, and for this reason dissipation which is the axis, is more contrary to temperance. Chapter 9 It has been said sufficiently then, that virtue of character is a mean condition, and in what way, namely because it is a mean between two kinds of vice, the one resulting from access and the other from deficiency, and that it is such a mean condition on account of being apt to hit the mean in feelings and actions. And this is why it is work to be of serious moral stature. Since in each kind of thing it is work to get hold of the mean. For instance, to take the center of a circle belongs not to everyone, but to one who knows something. So do while getting angry, or giving and spending money, belong to everyone and are easy. To whom and how much and when and for what purpose and in what way to do these things are no longer in everyone's power, nor are they easy. For this reason what is done well is rare and praiseworthy and beautiful. Hence the one who aims at the mean ought first to pull back from what is more contrary to it. Just as Calypso advises, keep the ship out beyond that thick spray and swell. For of the extremes, the one is a greater error, the other a lesser, since then to hit the mean with extreme precision is a difficult thing, as a second best way to sail. As people say, one ought to take the least of the evils and this will be most the case in the way which we are speaking of. Also one ought to consider what we ourselves are carried away toward, since different people are of a nature to incline toward different things, and that this will be recognizable from the pleasure or pain that comes about in our own case. 
we ought then to drag ourselves over toward the opposite side. For by pulling far away from going wrong, we will come to the mean. The very thing that people do who straighten warped pieces of lumber. And in everything one must guard most against the pleasant thing and against pleasure. For we do not judge it without bribes. So exactly the way the town elders fell towards Helen, we ought to feel towards pleasure and to think over in every instance what this said. For by sending it off in that way, we shall go astray less. By doing these things then, to say it in summary, we shall be most able to hit the mean. But this no doubt is difficult and especially in particular cases, for it is not easy to determine how and with whom and on what sort of grounds and for how much time one ought to be angry. And we sometimes praise those who underdo it and call them gentle, while at other times we praise those who are severe by proclaiming them manly. But the person who deviates a little from what is done well is not blamed, whether the deviation is toward the more or toward the less, but someone who deviates more is blamed for it, since this person does not escape notice. By what point and for how much of a deviation one is to be blamed is not easy to determine by a formulation, for no other perceptible thing is either such things are in the particulars and the judgment is in the perceiving. Therefore this much is clear, that while the mean active condition is praised in all things, one ought to incline away from it sometimes towards the excess, and sometimes towards the deficiency. For in that way we shall most easily hit the mark of the mean and of what is done well. And of Book 2